this 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 lady is a uh, <clears throat> this lady is something. She really is. Um, I, I do a number of biographies uh, besides uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, Helen Keller, Susan B. Anthony, Harriet Tubman, and some men like Winston Churchill, Edward Bernays. And yet I find one man is almost underneath Eleanor. Eleanor is probably the most popular. She just seems to attract the biggest crowd. But one seems to be coming up underneath her, and that's Vladimir Putin. Yeah. I speak about yeah, because he's topical. But getting back to Eleanor here, I think it's important that uh, to set the stage for Eleanor that the time she's born into, 1884, and this is a time, you know, this is 19 years after the end of the American Civil War or the war between the states, or for any of you who are from Southern Paratinge, I'll, I'll, I'll give you your due, the War of Northern Aggression, <laughs> if you want to call it that. I call it the revolt of the planters. This was their last gasp, and the Hamiltonian view was taking over. Industrialization and the financialization of America. Big trend coming. And so when you look at the time she's born into, you see a country that had 144,000 factories, her centers of production in 1865, 335,000 by 1900. This country produced $2 billion in manufactured goods in 1860, $11.5 billion by 1900. Went up five and a half times. The country is changing. The decade she's born into, the United States Navy, the New Steel Navy, they are commencing that. America's beginning to take its place on the world stage. And this is the, this is the country she is born into. And, a, and she will be born into a country where they're still using the horse and wagon to move people, and she will live to see the Cuban Missile Crisis. And she will, be a lar she will play a large part in this development. And interesting here, too, when she's born, she's born to an Elliot Bellick Roosevelt, who's going to be re related to Theodore Roosevelt, and an Anna Rebecca Hall Roosevelt. She will be one of three children. Elliot Roosevelt, and and an Elliot and an Elliot and, and a and, and another uh, Roosevelt son. Uh, there's Elliot Roosevelt, and uh, oh, I forgot the first name of the other one. Franklin, Franklin. <laughs> but anyway, uh, interesting here is there's another Elliot Roosevelt man, a half brother, who is a product of an indiscretion by her, between her father and one of the hired help. But interesting, they all don't live long. The half-brother will be dead by 1941. He's born in 1890 at age 51. Uh, Elliot, interesting here what happens to, uh, to, uh, to, to Eleanor here when she's, when, when she's eight years old. Her mother's going to die of diphtheria. Elliot will die at four years old of diphtheria when Eleanor is nine. And then her father, who was an alcoholic, will die. At when, she, when she's 10 years old, he throws himself out the window of a sanatorium. That won't kill him. He'll die later on of a seizure. She's going to have to live with her grandmother, uh, Mary Ludlow Hall. She's privately tutored. She doesn't go to public school. But again, the, the, again even though she comes from a family of privileged, this isn't all working out that well because she's, by the time she's a teen, we'll go back to 12, 13, 14, she's actually sleeping in her bedroom with the door locked because she can't trust her, gra her uh, grandmother's sons. This is not a very good way to start, but help is on the way. She's 15 years, 16 years old, and she's going to be sent to Allenswood, a finishing school for girls if you want to call it that, Wimbledon, not far from London. And it's there she will be under the tutelage of a Marie Sylvester. Marie Sylvester is going to help change your life. Marie Sylvester is one of those people who likes to inculcate in young women to be critical thinkers, free thinkers. And it's here Eleanor gets a wide variety of, of, of education here. She learns to speak French, gets involved with history, calisthenics, reading, writing, well-rounded person. She will be here until she's 17 when she'll come home in 1902. And you know, the, back then, you know, the debutantes have their coming out parties. 
She has that. She has another party, so on and so forth, which half these people she doesn't even know and doesn't even care about. But you have to go through the motions here. It's also in 1902. She's going to meet her future husband, Franklin, who is a cousin. He falls in love with her. And Sarah Delano Roosevelt enters the picture here. He do, she does not want her son marrying this woman. He says, I've made up my mind. He says, I understand this hurts you, but I've made up my mind. And he says, I want to spend my life with this young lady. Sarah takes her son on a three-month vacation in the Caribbean, hoping he'll forget Eleanor. Doesn't happen. They're going to be engaged, and they're going to set... Get set a date to be married. Now, I know I don't have to tell you. Uh, you ladies are usually the ones that handle most of the wedding arrangements here, right? The men really don't get as involved that much, but it's the women. But picture the, picture the situation here. Uh, her, father's, her father's dead. So her, un so her cousin, Teddy Roosevelt, is going to have to give the bride away. He's president. You have to work around the president's schedule. He says, well, I'm going to be in New York on, on March 17. This is 1905. Why don't you get married that day? That's St. Patrick's Day. So they'll get married St. Patrick's Day because that's the day Teddy can give the bride away. And it's interesting here, too, because, you know, uh, e even though Franklin and Eleanor are Roosevelt's, the president's there. Who's going to get most of the attention from the press? The president. One of the questions he's asked is, well, what do you think about the, you know, uh, the bride and groom both having the same name before they're married? He says, well, it's nice to keep the name of the family. <laughs> That's Teddy Roosevelt. So they will set up shop up at Hyde Park. They were also going to have apartments down in New York City. They are going to honeymoon for a week up at Hyde Park. They're eventually going to get away for a three-month three honeymoon in Europe. But in the meantime, they're setting up shop, really, in New York City in the apartments. And guess who has the adjoining apartments? Sarah Delano Roosevelt, complete with sliding doors. Now, keep in mind, they're going to have six children, Anna the daughter and five boys. And James Roosevelt later says that as we came along, my grandmother would say, your mother bore you, but I am really your mother. Imagine being a young bride and having to put up with that. And so, and so uh, this goes on for, let's say, this goes on for about 10 years. Keep in mind here that 1914, the Great War starts. We are going to be drawn into this conflict. Franklin is becoming more and more of a name in Democratic Party politics. He will be named Assistant Secretary of the Navy to the Secretary of the Navy, Josephus Daniels. This is a head start on that road to the White House. Now, keep in mind, Franklin's going to be traveling a lot. And in 1918, between one of his trips, Eleanor is unpacking his bags. And she finds some letters in one of his suitcases. Yeah, whoops is right, to Lucy Mercer, her social secretary. Franklin had been thinking for a while uh, to leave Eleanor. And Lewis Howe steps in. Lewis Howe is a primary advisor to Franklin Roosevelt. Now, keep in mind, this is 1918. This isn't 2018 here. You know, and Lewis Howe's trying to tell him it's kind of late for this. If you have aspirations of advancing your cause in politics, you better rethink this. In steps Sarah Delano Roosevelt. Now, this was a lady who did not want her son marrying Eleanor. And yet, what does she tell him? You get divorced if you want, but I'm going to disinherit you. What happened here? What happened here? You know, uh, you know, when a threat like this, you know, money has a tendency to change opinions. <laughs> and so he will not divorce her. But the marriage has changed, and irrevocably so. And so Eleanor is, begin to go, is going to begin to throw herself here into politics. You know, 1920, Franklin D. Roosevelt is going to be the VP. He's going to be the second fiddle to James Cox in the run for the White House. Him and Cox will lose that election to Warren G. Harding. However, 
you know, Eleanor throws herself into this campaign. She's branching out here. She's branching out. This is, an, this is another step in her development as an individual, individual here. But in 1921, what happens to Franklin? He's struck with polio, right? Capabello Island, remember that one? Yeah. Again, Sarah Delano Roosevelt urging her son, why don't you become a country gentleman and get out of politics? Eleanor says, no. And this is where you begin to see the equation change. Sarah, Eleanor, he's got to stay in the game. If he quits, it might kill him. Got to stay in the game. She's going to throw herself into politics here in 1924 when uh, Al Smith, the Irish Catholic, is running for re-election as governor in New York. She throws herself into this. 1928, she throws herself into two campaigns. Her husband running for the governorship of the state of New York and Al Smith running for the White House against Herbert Hoover, the Republican. What's interesting, I find how things, you know, the more things change, the more they remain the same. You know, there were Hooverite supporters who were saying that if the Irish Catholic from New York gets in the White House, he's going to install the Pope in the Oval Office. <laughs> and once the Pope gets to the Oval Office, the Inquisition will replace the Constitution as the law of the land. You know, there's people that believe this stuff. Remember that talk recently about Sharia law in this country? Yeah, people believe this stuff. It's amazing how things don't change here. Well, she winds up a victor in one of two of them anyway, helping her husband achieve the governorship of the state of New York. Interesting what you see here, Hoover takes over. Now, it's fascinating here too, you know, this idea of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Let's touch on this just for a moment. Franklin D. Roosevelt, and I, I like some of my liberal, you know, I have conservative and liberal friends here. I'm in more in the middle of the road here. But, and, and, I, and I like getting involved in some of these conversations. Well, Mr. Roosevelt was a liberal. Liberal, he was a banker. Eleanor is the liberal here, not her husband. <laughs> Franklin's a banker. He was a pragmatist. I'll give you that. Maybe he was the right man for his time. I'll give you that too. But Eleanor is the liberal here. He was a banker. You know, he's, he's, he's building up relationships with people like Bernard Baruch, Ger Gerard Swope from GE, John Roscob, GE, General Motors. And so it's interesting here when the Depression hits, 1929, that Gerald Swope comes out with a plan known as the Swope Plan to organize the economy under businessmen and bankers to get us out of the Depression. That's going to form the backdrop for the NRA, by the way, you know, when Roosevelt's in. However, the Depression does not help Mr. Hoover, the man who's going to say, well, during my term of office, people are going to give up good jobs for better ones selling apples on the street corner. That's not going to get you elected here. That's not going to get you elected. However, when Swope and them pitch their plan to Hoover, he says, this smells like warmed over fascism and I want no part of it. Well, guess where the money's going to go for the 32 election campaign? Roosevelt. Eleanor throws herself into this one. And she's going to help her husband get elected. Keep in mind, while he was governor, he's still suffering from the effects of polio. She's his legs. She's going throughout the, the Empire State, north, south, east, west, going to various hamlets, villages, towns, cities, what can we do to help you? Can we help you? What is it we can do for you? Well, what do you think is going to happen when her husband is president? Same sort of thing, only now it's on a national level. Interesting here, you know, when you have the change in administrations from the Hoover to the Roosevelt administration, there's always the meetings. She meets with Herbert Hoover's wife. Uh, and she, Mrs. Hoover, at one point was an ardent suffragette. And yet, when her husband became president, she became that usual first lady, the hostess type. And she said, as soon as, as, soon as Bertie became president, I figured I'd be his backstop. Oh, well, that's not going to happen now. You know, that's not going to happen on my watch, is virtually what Eleanor is going to say here. And she's going to transform this idea of the first lady. And it's really because of her that this really becomes an office, being a first lady. This is a lady who in 1933 
is going to make $75,000 that year as a speaker. And Wow is right. She won't keep most of that money. She'll devote it to different causes. This is a lady who during her tenure as first lady for 12 years will give 348 press conferences. This is a lady, first lady, the first one to give a spe keynote speech at a presidential convention, which she does for the Democrats in 1940. This is a lady who will publish some 62 major magazine articles in major, in, in major magazines in this country. She will start a column in 1936 known as My Day, which she will write till 1962, the same year of her death. This is a lady who will make contact with various other ladies of note. Amelia Earhart is one. She becomes pretty good friends with Amelia Earhart. Amelia even takes her up. Well, you know, and, uh, uh, Eleanor wants to learn how to fly. It's, it's also said that one time in 1934, Amelia Earhart uh, spent an overnight at the White House. And I don't think first ladies do this anymore. And it's stated that her and Eleanor got all gussied up and went out for a night, snuck out of the White House and went out for a night on the town. <laughs> Another lady of note who becomes very friendly with Eleanor Roosevelt is Lorena Hickok, a well-known uh, female reporter of her day. She worked with the Associated Press. It was also rumored, let's put it this way, rumored that she was a homosexual. And she became enamored with Eleanor Roosevelt. Well, what do you think the stories that are going to start here? Now, you know how that's going to work. And so because of the fact she was so enamored with Eleanor Roosevelt, she's going to lose her job with the Associated Press. She'll be fired. Eleanor is going to take her on as a so-called press booster, an investigator for the NRA, and passing the New Deal. And so this begins a long relationship with Lorena Hickok. Um, Eleanor, too, gets involved in a project known as Arthurdale in West Virginia. This pertains to miners who tried to unionize and got fired by the companies. You know, the depression's in full swing anyway. You know, when Mr. Roosevelt took office, the unemployment rate in this country was 25%. Keep in mind, is there a social safety net in 33? No. Are many women, percentage-wise, working in the economy as now? No. So many families have one income, and when that husband loses his job, what happens to that family? That's a problem. That's an issue. That's a real issue here. She tries to start Arthurdale in West Virginia. This is almost a throwback to some of these socialist experiments of the 19th century, like Robert Owen in England, who, tr who had New Lanark, where he had a you know, cotton mill in a development where people worked, lived, ate, were educated in the same development here. It's almost like one of those. And of course, when this starts, what is, the, what is the conservative members of Congress, what, what is their reply? Well, this is, a, this is socialism. This is a communist plot. There were many Democrats who said, we can't, you can't mix business and, and, and government. You can't do that. She does. Her husband says, go for it. And so she starts this development where miners will live together, almost like the Owen idea of New Lanark. And people will live together, not mining maybe have a production facility, maybe making trinkets, whatever it is, to sell them. But people will be working together, living together. The kids will be educated in the same development here. She runs into a roadblock here among these miners. White Christians will not want to live in the same development as Jewish miners or black miners. That gets to be a problem. So now she wants to have developments for black miners, for Jewish miners. And keep in mind, this, this lady is really becoming involved in civil rights here. You know, this is really going to push the envelope for her. And this thing, Arthurdale, will last till 1941 when the war takes over. And Eleanor's concern is focus on the war will lessen involvement with civil rights. And she's going to be quite right about this. But at the same time here, she's also one who's going to be instrumental in pushing 
the black agenda, the black constituency, from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. Of course, one of the poster child expressions of this, Marian Anderson, the singer, who was denied, who was denied singing for the Daughters of the American Revolution. Eleanor is going to do two things here. Number one, she's going to turn in her membership to the DAR, and number two, get her to sing at the Lincoln Memorial. She's also going to bring Marian Anderson into the White House to sing for foreign dignitaries. King, the King of England, for the King Queen of England, for one thing. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, this lady is really a mover and a shaker when it comes to civil rights. You know, it's interesting here too when when you go back to the the beginning of the war. 1939, um, she volunteers for the Red Cross and she wants to go to Europe as a Red Cross volunteer, help people who are being hurt by the war. She finally listens to her husband's advisors. Uh, we don't think that's a good idea because what happens if you get captured by the Germans or the G Germans or the Italians and you wind up in a prisoner of war camp? Wouldn't look too good if the First Lady is is stuck in a German or Japanese prisoner of war camp. And so what she'll do is she'll volunteer to tour uh, and visit the troops in, in, in Europe and the Pacific. <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is, 1941 when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, um, her husband will sign, sign executive order 9066. This is the roundup of the Japanese to be put in internment camps. She's dead set against this. How can you round up fellow American citizens? I would have loved to have been in the White House on that dinner between her and her husband when they're discussing this. That must have been an interesting dinner. But what's fascinating here is they're going to round up 110,000 Japanese, many of them on the West Coast. And they're going to be put in internment camps like Manzanar. Interesting aspect here is they round them up but then again, their sons are going to wind up fighting in Italy in 43 and 44, fighting the Germans. They won't send them to the Pacific, but they send them to Italy. And what's another fascinating aspect here, while their parents are incarcerated, that the 442nd Regimental Combat Team of Japanese-American troops fighting in Italy is the most decorated unit in the United States Army in World War II. And I find a parallel here with someone else, Joe Stalin, our ally, and he's gonna round up the Crimean Tartars and send, of course, he's not just gonna incarcerate him, he's gonna throw them on the boxcars and just dump them in Irkutsk while their sons are in the Red Army fighting the Germans. Interesting the parallels here. Fascinating the parallels, you know, and it's fascinating here too, her part in this, you know, Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt are the big three, right? Yeah. The day Pearl Harbor was bombed is interesting. You know, it's morning in Hawaii. You go through the time zones west, or east rather, and London, it's getting dark. That same day, Churchill is entertaining John J. Winnett, our ambassador to England, and Averill Harriman, remember him? Later become ambassador to the Soviet Union. And in the course of this dinner, an adjutant comes in with a note. Churchill reads it, hands it to Winnett. Winnett's eyes get as big as his glasses. The Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. Churchill motions for paper and pencil. He's going to write a declaration of war to be sent to the Japanese embassy. And when it says, aren't you going to ask for confirmation? Churchill's waiting for nothing. He wants us in the war so bad he could taste it. And, he, and this is going to be delivered the next day, the 8th. The same day Mr. Roosevelt's going to go before Congress and ask for that declaration of war. Last president to do so, by the way. And so, and, he, and Churchill phrases, and he says, he, says, I, he says, he admits later on he was criticized. He phrases this in the most polite, typical Churchill, the most polite language possible. Even signing this declaration of war, your most obedient servant, Winston, Winston S. Churchill. I got this thing home. It's fascinating to read. And he says, he says, I was later criticized. And Churchill, a typical Churchill, he would have been great on Dean Martin's roasts. 
Typical Churchill. He says, when you have to kill a man, it costs you nothing to be polite. Well, after, after, you know, after we get into the war here, he comes to the United States. He'll spend three weeks in the White House. And, you know, Mr. Churchill liked to stay up late, smoking one of those big cigars, downing a brandy or two or three or four or five, whatever the case may be, and talking politics, history, so on and so forth. And Roosevelt and Franklin is trying to stay up, and he's, you know, and Eleanor is burning. What's the matter with Winston? Doesn't he know Franklin doesn't have this constitution? He can't stay up late. And she's angry. She is fit to be tied. But for three weeks, Mr. Churchill would stay at the White House, and they'd have these conversations late at night, and Franklin just can't stay up. But, of course, Frank, uh, Winston Churchill is going to make that brilliant speech to Congress in January 1942 because the way is set. Eleanor. Globetrotter. Now she's not only representing her husband first in the state of New York, then throughout the country, now overseas. She goes to England in 1942 because of the 8th Army Air Force buildup going on here. You know, we're, L L England's going to be an aircraft carrier for the bombing campaign. She goes over well here among the troops and with the British. Very popular. 43. She goes to the Pacific. <clears throat> and here she goes to the Southwest Pacific area, the Solomon Islands, Guadalcanal, Bougainville, Vela La Vela, you know, Rendova, places like this, uh, names that have long been forgotten. And she's in the jungles here with, with GIs and Marines. Where are you from? Can we do something? I mean, here's a lady who's no spring chicken at this point in this place where these guys are going to wind up with scrub typhus, beriberi, malaria, jungle rot, so on and so forth. You know, it's not a place you want to go to. And uh, she's very popular. In fact, William Bull Halsey, Admiral Halsey, will later say, of the many people who came to visit the men under my command, she wound up being the most popular. Interesting what this lady is doing here. Absolutely fascinating during the war. However, She's also for bringing in escaped Jewish people to this country, escaping Nazi persecution. Her husband will accede to the demands of his advisors. No. They're going to slip in saboteurs. They're going to slip in spies. But she's an ardent supporter of bringing people who are, particularly in this point, Jewish people, who are escaping Nazi persecution. I don't have to tell you what's going on here by 1942, um, you know, with the, the, the death camps. And then the question comes up, and I'm always asked this question, well, why didn't they bomb the camps? You know, they knew by 42 what was going on here. It's no secret at this point. There had been enough people who had escaped who sounded the alarm here. Um, and what's interesting here, too, is this program uh, on Losung, or the Final Solution, actually comes out of, in the end, the T4 program. How many are familiar with that one? That's interesting, where the Nazis were looking to, you know, through a program starting in 39, really, racial hygiene. How do you like that terminology? They were getting rid of those considered incurably physically handicapped. Mental incompetence, that's their term, not mine, that's their term. And they start at, at a fetus to age three, then broaden it to age 16, and then just took in the entire adult population. And uh, interesting, interesting the categories here. Uh, those, again, incurably physical handicap, mentally incompetent, and then borderline juvenile delinquency for teenagers. Who, who determines this? And then the big one here. Inferior genes. How do you like that one? Uh, and then, <clears throat> but of course, you know, it's interesting. They're going to uh, get rid of about 75,000 people. Most of them are Christian at this point. Most are Christian here at this point. And then when the people rise up, it's one of the few times in 1941 that Hitler will accede to the people. They don't want this. Now, this has been categorized as euthanasia. I disagree. I disagree with that. What is, you, what is euthanasia in the dictionary? Webster's. Yeah, okay. Animals are human beings, right? 
Is this done for mercy? No. Is it premeditated? It's organized medical killing. Let's call it what it is. It's not euthanasia. She is definitely in favor of bringing escaped Jewish people here. He accedes to his, and again, you, you, you see a pattern here. He accedes to his advisors. No, they're going to slip in, they're going to slip in, uh, you know, saboteurs and spies. Well, we know there was an anti-Jewish bent here. Okay, we understand that. Also, go back to 1934. Again, you see a pattern here. And when she was, she was for uh, establishing a federal law opposed to lynching of blacks. Wasn't that going on here? Yeah, it sure was. The Castigan-Wagner bill. That's what she was for. And she even brought in the president of the NAACP to lobby her husband in the Oval Office. She brought in other black leaders to lobby her husband in the Oval Office. He, in the end, will not support the bill. Why? Because he wants the Southern vote for the 1935-36 elections. And so, you know, again, power here. Now, the question, I'm always asked this whenever I give talks on World War II. Well, why didn't they bomb the camps? Let's understand something here. You know, this is a war. <laughs> it's a global war. It's an industrialized, commercialized war. That's what you're seeing, total war here. You know, this is no longer the wars of, early, of earlier times here. This is an industrialized, commercialized war. And you're, and you're getting your entire population and your entire economy ready for war. That's what it takes. At the same time here, there are the war aims. Look at the situation, 42, 43, 44, 45. The trains that are being used, moving Jewish people, gypsies, to the camps. Are they moving troops to the front? Are they moving guns to the front? Are they moving ammunition to the front? No. Why bomb them? Men guarding the camps, are they at the front? No. Why bomb them? Get the picture here? Get the picture here? Now, it's fascinating to see the war aims take over. And so what is happening to people who are, we'll call them, ethnically unacceptable? Okay. But at the same time, the tracks in the rolling stock aren't going to be bombed because of that. I mean, you have, to, you have to see the reality here. This is what the Allies are seeing here. They're interested in the war. Of course, there is going to be a comeuppance for some of these Nazis. I'll give you that. At the expense of what? It's a problem here. However, Mr. Roosevelt, I'll get to your question in just a moment. Mr. Roosevelt's going to die, though, on April 12, 1945. Now, what I find fascinating about this is Eleanor here. Whenever a world leader dies, what happens? The telegrams, cables, letters, don't they pour in from, from other countries, right? Yeah. One of them sticks out here. Mr. Stalin. Mr. Stalin. He writes to Eleanor, have an autopsy done. Well, look at his situation. Do you trust anybody? Do you, you think he just died here? Maybe he was poisoned? Assassinated? Yeah. Have an autopsy done. And what's Eleanor's reply? Apparently, Mr. Stalin doesn't understand we are not that way. Now, you know, and again, my, I remember my father. My, my father was a radio man, Navy radio man in World War II, and his ship was at Okinawa. And, uh, and my father said he was on duty when the message came in that, Mr., that the president had died. Now, he had to make three copies of every message that came into the ship. One goes into the arch ship's archives, one stays, in the, one stays in the radio shack, and the other directly goes to the captain right away. The captain has to know what's going on. And my father said, he says, you know, when you're 19 and stupid, he says, if I had thought ahead, I would have made, I should have made five, six copies, but I didn't know I was going to have any kids. And I, yeah, I said, yeah, that would have been a great keepsake. But uh, again, what happens to Eleanor here? She's eventually going to have to move out of the White House because Truman's going to be the president at this point. And so she will go back to Valkyll. Her husband had left in the will that Hyde Park was to be turned into a museum slash library. This is going to be the start of what these presidents have been doing ever since here. And so Mr. Truman, you know, Mr. Truman's interesting because when she dies, 
he's later going to say that she was not only the first lady of the United States, she was first lady of the world. And that's going to come from her naming her as a delegate to the new thing known as the United Nations. This, is ta this organization is tailor-made for this lady because of her regard for her fellow man here. And so as a delegate, she not only will be an American delegate, she will actually be the first chairman of the Commission of Human Rights. She's not only that, she will be co-author of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from the United Nations. And interestingly enough, when this is ratified by the member nations of the United Nations, it will be practically, I say practically unanimous because of the amount of countries. Uh, eight countries will not ratify it. The Soviet Union and the East Bloc, that's understandable, Mr. Stalin won't ratify that. Two other countries come to mind here, South Africa and Saudi Arabia. Surprise, surprise. But other, but other countries will ratify this. And this helps, to, you know, again, this is tailor-made for this lady. She'll be the commissioner of, of you know, of, of, the, of human rights for the United Nations up to about 1953. But again, she's getting involved in local politics. I say local politics, state of New York. You know, her name is considered maybe for a House seat, Senate seat. How about a VP candidate? That's interesting. You know, she's another one of these ladies that's raising the stature of women, like Amelia Earhart, like Helen Keller. Helen Keller's still alive at this point. Susan B. Anthony before her. And so you are seeing here this lady raising the stature of women, but involved in local politics. <laughs> uh, she gets into a problem with the Catholic Church in New York. Cardinal Spellman come to mind here. You know, he was for New York tax money to support parochial schools. She was dead set against this. And she took a lot of flack. You're anti-Catholic. You know how this is going to come about here. You're anti-Catholic. Also, her, her son, Franklin Jr., was, was going to run for the attorney generalship of the state of New York. Uh, Carmine DeSapio. How many here from New York remember that name? Wow. Tammany Hall come to mind here? Yeah, was against that. And she didn't like his tactics. And she's going to get together on a committee to hound Carmine DeSapio out of Tammany Hall. That's not going to work until about 1960-61. But this lady is like a terrier. Once she bites into something, she doesn't let go here. She will also be involved in national politics. Adlai Stevenson. You know, she's going to push Stevenson as a Democratic nominee for president in 52, 56, and again, 1960, three times. Although by this time, 1960, there's a young man from Massachusetts coming up, John Kennedy. And many Democrats want her to, to, to cease the Stevenson candidacy because that's not going to work here. You know, that's getting kind of long in the tooth. And she says, no, I'm not supporting Kennedy. She won't support them. And big names go here. Uh, Gore Vidal is one of them. He got to know Mrs. Roosevelt pretty good. In fact, Mr. Gore Vidal is going to ask her when he really gets to know her, what about this story about Amelia Earhart being ordered or asked by her husband to spy on the Japanese in the Pacific? Is there any truth to this? Maybe that resulted in her death. And she tells Gore Vidal, well, as you might expect... I had an investigation done on my own, and that's just not true. But he asked her, you know, don't support Stevenson. Support this new kid, John Kennedy. No. You know who else goes to see her? Frank Sinatra. She tells Sinatra, no. She will finally come around when she realizes that, yeah, you know, Stevenson's not going to win this. Uh, let's, I'll throw my lot to Kennedy. But her big gripe about John F. Kennedy was, and she says this on more than one occasion, he did next to nothing to fight McCarthyism. Yeah, she was right. She was right. But when John F. becomes president, he will name her to his commission on women. And she will hold that position until she dies in 1962. 
Um, yeah, she'll die in 1962, but I find fascinating here that in 1999, there was a poll taken, I think it was a Gallup poll, and the most influential American, you know, they're asking people, they're polling people, and 37 years after her death, she finished ninth, still finished ninth as one of the most influential Americans in the 20th century. Uh, you can say what you want about her, whether you agree with her or not. She was the quintessential American liberal here. And again, go back to what I mentioned earlier, the time she's born into. America is moving from a colonial backwater to a global power. She will see this country become a superpower. She will see the demise of the British, French, and other European, the other European powers brokering world affairs, colonialism, European colonialism. She sees this die, and she sees the new reality in the world by 1945 because she sees the two countries that are going to win this war by 45, the United States and the Soviet Union, and the world changed. Interesting, this lady's part in this progression and what she sees, horse and buggy to the Cuban Missile Crisis. What a progression that is. And she had a large part in this, a large part in, in what's gonna happen here. Because of her term as first lady, she transforms the office. Fascinating, fascinating lady here. And we only just scratched the surface here. Anybody have any questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. That's, that's, that's an interesting question, but then we can go back to Marie Sylvester at Allenswood who began to really chart that course for this lady as a, crit not just critical thinker, free thinker, learning French, learning history, calisthenics. Uh, in fact, when she comes home, she's working at the New York Junior League, uh, you know, with, with, um, with Mary Harriman. Ah, the Harriman name again. And, uh, and she's helping disadvantaged kids from the slums, east side slums, uh, become, you know, in calisthenics, in dance, in learning history, trying to prepare these slum kids for school. So she, this, is, this, is, this seed's already been planted. And I think now her husband being struck with polio, did it accentuate what's developing here? Probably, because now she's got to be his legs when he's the governor. When he's the president, in fact, um, the bonus soldiers, the guys, you know, at, uh, you know, during the Depression in 1932, when they descended on Washington, what did Hoover do? He sent the troops. Douglas MacArthur helped break this up. And so did Eisenhower as his adjutant. And so the following year, they come back because Roosevelt's in office. Franklin doesn't send the troops. Who goes there to talk to these soldiers? Eleanor. And what is going through all these hovels of, the, of these, of these, uh, these ex-World War I soldiers? Gee, last year we, we were here and Hoover sent the army. This year we're here and Frank, the president sends his wife. Yeah, same sort of thing you're going to see develop when she goes to the Pacific. In this slap in the jungle, talk, jungles, talking to Marines and GIs. So, yeah, I, I, do I think that her husband's plight with polio accentuated it? Yes, but do I think... Well, maybe it would have went in another direction, but I think that seed was planted already, and I think, um, you know, her, her course has already been charted. I mean, this is a lady, and again, and again this is a lady who it's, you know, her biographers would say, uh, again, this, presents a, this, this presents a psychological dichotomy here. This is a lady who supposedly was not a fan of sex and even mentioned that having children is a chore. And she con did, considered herself not geared to children. And yet at the same time, if you went up to this lady with a sob story, I lost my job, I haven't eaten in two days, whatever the case may be, she'd give you the jacket off her back. And yet, I'm not geared to motherhood. 
That presents an interesting character study. Hmm. Interesting. But she considered herself not, not really a, a really bona fide mother figure, yet she was concerned about her fellow man. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. There's more to it than what we're discussing here, but it's fascinating. Yes, sir. She took it in stride. She mentioned when she was 14 or 15, she knew she wasn't the prettiest face to come down the pike. She already knew this then. But she said, if you have honesty, honesty, honesty and a willingness to make a difference stamped on your face, it really doesn't make any difference what you look like. Something along those lines. That's not exact, but I'm paraphrasing what she said. And so, you know, even though she's, even though she's uh, no Jane Mansfield, uh, <laughs> did she make more of a dent than Jane Mansfield? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And she also shares something else here because she's the, uh, she, she, she shares with two other first ladies, being the tallest first ladies we've ever had, Mrs. Obama and Mrs. Trump. 5'11". Yeah. Yeah. In fact, Gore Vidal said, according to going back to the press here, uh, as compared to other first ladies who came before her, she was a giantess. <laughs> we haven't had a six footer yet. We're on the way. Yes. Yes, sir. You know, I didn't, I didn't get into that too much, but he really, he was, he was enamored with her in 1902. Um, and of course his mother's gonna try to stop this, but he, he real, I guess he really fell in love with her. But then again, what happened by 1918? I mean, she, she was a fascinating person to talk to, even, even when she was only 18 or 19 or 20, because of that diversified education she got. And again, Marie, now again, Marie Sylvester is interesting here because in England she was a suffragette and she was also a lesbian. Yeah. Now there's going to be other people like this coming in her life. Uh, mm -hmm. Lorena Hickok, one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, and, she, and to get away from the family and the kids, she'd escape up Valkyl, the cottage, and she supposedly had people like this there. Now again, the stories start. And this doesn't necessarily, and, and, and Doris, Doris Goodwin Kern says, you know, don't read, she, she did a biography on the Roosevelt's and she said, don't read too much into this. You know, try to look at this thing historically instead of like from the inquirer point of view, <laughs> you know, if that's possible. So well, let me, let me, yes ma'am. I didn't get into that uh, really too much, but from her attitude during the war, um, when she wanted to bring escaped Jewish people here from Nazi persecution, I would hazard a guess and say she would have been a booster of this. As a, of, you know, this, of course, ha you having said that, this, this uh, next month marks the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration, which comes out of what? World War I, and that's a war we have yet to get away from. You know, uh, this is the war that's going to breed the Sykes-Pico Agreement, uh, the Balfour Declaration, the San Remo Conference, the Treaty of Sevres, the Treaty of Lausanne, and, and, who, and, who, write, and who draws all those borders? The Brits and the French. And they draw those borders through clannish associations, tribal affiliations, religious differences, and ethnic passions, and you don't think you're not going to have a problem here. So. Well, keep in mind what else is going on. Bouncing off what you're saying is, is there, 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 there was a viable socialist party. Eugene Debs ran for president, what, five, six times? And guess who campaigned for him? Helen Keller. She was an ardent socialist. Mm. 
vehement pacifist, didn't like Woodrow Wilson at all. Interesting, what, interesting the politics going on at, with, with her as a young lady here. So is this going to influence you? Of course it is. You're going to be, you're going to be playing in this, in the, you're going to be in this environment here. And you're going to have to bounce off what's happening. It's fascinating. This, this period of American history is absolutely fascinating. to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.